You know, the Bible states that evil communication corrupts good morals. And this text is often cited to warn Christians about hanging around unbelievers. Well, if you'll check the verse, the words that come before and afterwards, what you're going to find is that Paul is addressing false doctrine. And so what he is saying is that false doctrine corrupts good morals. But this is, this is also true about hanging around unbelievers. But anyway, in this context, certain Corinthians were denying the bodily resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what Paul is saying is that false doctrine corrupts good morals. In fact, this is what happens to us when we teach false doctrines or false teachings. And what happens is it stunts our sanctification. And so I want you to think about this for a moment because I'm going to return to this at the very end of this video, which is now part seven in my ongoing series on the doctrine of the Trinity. In my previous video, I pointed out that the, that the meaning angel is not attested anywhere until 382 AD. And this means that the Hebrew word malak and the Greek word angelos could not possibly carry the meaning angel in either the Old or the New Testaments. And so in addition, I also pointed out that the Hebrew term malak and the Greek word angelos carries the meaning of messenger. And so when we look at the, therefore, the, the so-called angel of the Lord or the malak of Yahweh, the messenger of Yahweh, he is nothing more than a manifestation of Yahweh himself in the person of the pre-existent Logos, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I pointed out in the previous video, even if somebody wants to insist that the word, that the meaning angel is attested there in the Old Testament, then, well, you have a slew of problems because then you have a messenger or a, a, a feathery winged celestial being accepting the worship due to Yahweh and Yahweh alone. And then worse yet, you have Gideon and Abraham worshiping a celestial feathery winged creature. But in any event, so I also mentioned in my previous video that we would explore the Latin Vulgate's invention of the word and the meaning angel in, the, in my next video. So this is what we're going to do in this video. So let me very quickly tell you what you can expect to see in the next several minutes of this video. We're going to look at the groundbreaking discovery that a certain Hebrew scholar and ancient Semitic language specialist made back in 1944 and how subsequent scholars recognize this error that the Latin Vulgate's so-called translators made. These scholars affirmed this seminal discovery. And after this, we're going to trace the Jewish understanding of the meaning of Malach from its first occurrence when it was first recorded in Genesis 16:7, up to the period when the Latin Vulgate was composed. And I'm going to do this through a chart containing a timeline, which I have constructed. It is designed to show how Malak carried the meaning messenger up until the time when the Latin Vulgate translators tinkered with the Greek word angelos in 382 AD and created the word angel and the meaning angel. After this, we're going to look at how this was done. And I will follow this at the very end by showing you how many types of feathery winged celestial beings the Bible teaches that there are. And we're going to take a closer look at the words that are used to denote such creatures. And I think that it might come as a surprise to some of you. So let's get down to business. In my previous video, I pointed out that the Hebrew word malak means messenger, not angel. And I stressed repeatedly that the Hebrew word malak refers to his activity, not to his nature. So when he's speaking of the angel of the Lord or the malak of Yahweh, it refers to his activity and not to his nature. Moreover, I also pointed out that Malak and his ancient Semitic equivalents all carry the meaning messenger, not angel. Additionally, I also noted that, that although the Old and New Testaments do not contain a word that carries the meaning angel, there are words that the Bible uses to denote feathery winged celestial beings, and they are cherub, cherubim, seraph, seraphim, Elohim but angel is not one of them. Moreover, I also noted that the meaning angel is not attested anywhere in ancient literature prior to the Latin Vulgate superimposing it in the Bible in 382 AD. If you recall, I mentioned that this has been thoroughly documented by experts in ancient Semitic languages. 
And I raised the question in my previous video, how did we get here? If the Hebrew word malach and the Greek word angelos means messenger in the Bible, how did the word angel get into our Bibles? Well, let's look at the facts and learn who the man was who discovered when the meaning angel first occurs in any literature, ancient or not so ancient. And then we'll see how another Hebrew scholar put it, how the Latin Vulgate's so-called translators superimposed the word angel into the Old Testament, and I might add, into our English Bibles. Walter Bumgardner was the Hebrew scholar who made the groundbreaking discovery that the first time the meaning angel ever appears in any literature historically. And this is in 382 AD with the Vatican and the composition of the Latin Vulgate. Baumgartner was also a philologist, philosopher, and former professor of Old Testament and Semitic languages at the University of Basel from 1929 to 1958. His seminal discovery has also been noted and recognized by at least five other scholars who followed him that I am aware of, and we're going to read what three of them had to say about this. In 1956, Baumgartner was invited to complete a supplement to the Hebrew Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament written by Ludwig Kohler. This was six months prior to Kohler's death. The supplement was issued in 1957, together with the first edition of this five-volume work. So this gives you an idea of Baumgartner's expertise. Now, I have been unable to locate the original publication containing his monograph, which appeared in a German publication, where he made his discovery public. But I do not have, but, but what I do have is an English publication that was originally written in German by another German scholar who read Baumgartner's monograph and mentions Baumgartner's seminal discovery. And this is where I first learned of his groundbreaking discovery. Gerhard von Rod was one of the most influential scholars of the 19th century, and for good reason. His insights into many Old Testament texts marked him as a uniquely gifted theologian. And this is taken from his two-volume Old Testament Theology, Volume 1, page 285. Von Rod has written, Walter Bumgartner has drawn attention to the fact that the Greek angelos, too, is not yet a categorical term for heavenly beings. And in the New Testament, also it is still used for human messengers, Luke 7, 24, 9, 52. The angelus of the Vulgate is the first to mean angel. Walter Baumgartner, Zoom Problem des Jawingels, on the problem of Jawingel, or the angel of the Lord. He continues, in Schwitz Theology, Umschau, 1944, pages 97 and following. And then he says, cross-reference further, F. Steyer, Gott und Seen Engel im Alten Testament, meaning God and his angel in the Old Testament. Munster 1934, and then he also lists Eichrod, Walter Eichrod, his, the his Old Testament theology, volume 2, pages 6 and following. So, there are four scholars mentioned in this citation alone who affirm the fallacy committed by the Latin Vulgate, von Rahn, Bumgartner, Steyer, and Eichrod. And now I want to cite two other scholars bringing the total to six scholars who recognized the Vulgate's fallacy, beginning with Carol A. Newsom's comments in her entry in the Anchor Bible Dictionary. Newsom is a biblical scholar, Jewish historian, and a literary critic. Newsom has written, It was only with the Vulgate that a systematic distinction was made between angelic emissaries, Latin angelus, and human ones, Latin Nuntius. There it is again. The Vulgate marked the point where an unwarranted distinction was made between celestial and terrestrial messengers, and a new meaning to for Angelas and Malak was invented, the meaning angel. This brings the number of scholars who affirm Baumgartner's discovery to six, and this brings us to what another Old Testament scholar had to say. I draw your attention to the bottom of the screen. This citation is taken from Volume 2 in Claus Westerman's full-orbited three-volume commentary on Genesis. 
This is taken from volume two, entitled Genesis 12 through 36. Westerman has written, The defect in most attempts so far to explain the phrase Malach Yahweh in the Old Testament is that one takes as starting point a superimposed concept, either quote-unquote angel. Such a superimposed concept does not occur in the Old Testament. So, W. Bumgardner. So, this means that Bumgardner affirmed this. He goes on, notice. This only arose when the Greek rendered other heavenly beings by Angelos and the Vulgate introduced the distinction between Nuntius, a human messenger, and Angelos, a divine messenger, both of which were covered by quote-unquote angel. Westerman, along with Bumgardner, point the finger at the Latin Vulgate so-called translation as the first time that the meaning angel ever occurs in any type of literature historically. So there you have it. Once again, at least six scholars, some of which are experts in ancient Semitic languages, mark 382 AD as the first time the meaning angel ever occurs in any type of literature, ancient or more recent. And you know, now the next thing that I want to do is I want to walk you through the chart that I mentioned, which I constructed, which I think will help you to see how Malak carried the meaning messenger throughout the period when the Old and New Testaments were written. This will bring us to the time when a new meaning of the Greek word angelos was introduced by fallible men and then inserted into the Word of God. This was then read back into the Hebrew Scriptures and the word Malak, thereby superimposing a meaning into Malak that is not attested in any ancient literature. It is my prayer that this will help you to recognize what Baumgartner discovered. That the Latin Vulgate's so-called translators were guilty of inserting a foreign concept into the Word of God. Let's take a look at my chart. Discerning the meaning of Malak prior to the Latin Vulgate. What I'm going to do is I'm going to begin at the far left-hand side of the chart and work my way from left to right. Above the pink timeline on the left side of the screen towards the blue timeline on the right-hand side. And I'm going to list the people whom the Malak of Yahweh appear to above and below the pink timeline. These are the people that are mentioned in the Old Testament passages which I cited in my previous video. And below that, I have listed the approximate dates that the account was recorded in the Bible. And like I said, I'm going to work my way through the Old Testament period, the intertestamental period, into the New Testament period, and so forth. But I want to begin at the upper right-hand corner of the screen, the Old Testament period. And over to the right, we have the New Testament period. So now over to the left, just above the pink timeline, you'll see the name Abraham and Hagar. This is circa 1405 when Genesis was composed, describing this account. So the word Malak, is, this is the first occurrence in the Old Testament, and it was written sometime around 1405. Next, we, lo we looked at the historical books, Judges, where Gideon is confronted by the Malak of Yahweh, and the book of Judges was composed circa 1050 B.C. Then I also cited Zechariah in the book of the Minor Prophets, which was written in 520 B.C. Here, the priest and the Malak of Yahweh are spoken of as the Malak of Yahweh in Malachi 2.7 and in Zechariah 1.12. Moving forward, this brings us to the intertestamental period, which is roughly sometime around 420 was when it began. And then it brings us to the first century and the crucifixion of, of our beloved Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The first century, 1 through 99. And this is when Matthew's Gospel was composed, circa 60 to 70 AD. And this is the text in, Ma in Matthew 11.10, which the Holy Spirit divinely interprets for us the meaning of Malak through the Greek word angelos. After this, other writings were ensued, bringing us up to the time of the Latin Vulgate, which was composed in 382 AD. Now, if you'll recall, 
All rabbis base their teachings on their rabbis' teachings, who base their teachings on their rabbis' teachings, and so forth. And so, this gave their teachings credibility. Uh, this forms an embryo of teaching and understanding going back into previous generations. You also see this practice in 2 Timothy 2.2, which reads, And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2.2 Paul is instructing Timothy to pass on the teachings of Christ to men who were divinely and uniquely gifted, who would then pass them on to other divinely gifted men. This reveals an embryonic thread that can be traced back to its origin. And the same can be said of the Hebrew word malach. Notice, the Hebrew word malach and its ancient Semitic equivalents can be traced back consistently carrying the meaning messenger throughout the ancient world. In Sumer, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Ethiopia, the New Testament period, and other writings chronologically. That is, until the Greek word angelos suffered at the hands of the Latin Vulgate so-called translators when they invented a new meaning, a new word for angelos. This is not to say that liberal Jews do not deviate from the Tanakh. But what this does is to it reveals a consistent thread or embryo of understanding dating back as far as the time when Genesis was written, which records the very first occurrence of the Hebrew word malach. And now let's look at how more than likely the word angel was created and therefore the meaning angel. Let's look at how the Latin Vulgate translators came up with the Latin word angelus, which the English word angel is derived from. The Latin Vulgate is largely the work of Jerome. I'm going to explain how this was more than likely done, and then I'll illustrate this through several slides for you. We're going to begin with the Greek word angelos, which is what the Latin Vulgate first dealt with. And the Latin term angelus is a transliteration of the Greek word angelus. Well, what's a transliteration? The use of the closest corresponding letters of another language. So the Latin term angelus, which the Latin Vulgate created, is a transliteration of the Greek word angelos. It is not a translation. Now I'm going to go through this a couple of ways in order for you to grasp the fallacy committed by the Latin Vulgate translators when they came up with the word angelus and a new meaning for God's feathery winged celestial creatures. And the word I'm going to use in both of my examples is the Greek word pronounced uranos. And over to the right, we have its transliteration. In English, uranos. So uranos, like the Latin angelus, is a transliteration, not a translation. And the Latin angelus is a transliteration of the Greek angelos, like uranos is an English transliteration of the Greek uranos. But what does uranos mean? Heaven. Heaven is a translation, not a transliteration. We don't say, when I die, I'm going to Uranus. No, we cite the English translation of Uranus, not its transliteration. We say, when I die, I'm going to heaven. So why do we use the English transliteration of the Latin transliteration of the Greek word angelos? All three words, angelus, angel, and Uranus are all transliterations. Heaven is a translation. Let's look at this a little bit closer now. First, we have the Greek word pronounced uranos. Then we have its transliteration. A transliteration is the use of the corresponding letters of another language. Uranos is the English transliteration of the Greek word uranos. Its translation, on the other hand, is heaven. And Uranus is a transliteration of the Greek Uranus. Heaven, on the other hand, once again, is a translation. Now let's follow this same analysis with the Greek word angelos. The Latin transliteration of angelos, the Greek, is angelus. And its translation 
as Carol Newsom, the contributor to the Anchor Bible Dictionary, noted, is states that there is no English equivalent to Angles. So therefore, hopefully this will help you. Now, now I hope that you can appreciate what I'm about to do, because this is how the English word angel was created. First, we have the Greek word angelos. Next, it's transliteration. What is a transliteration? Once again, a transliteration is the use of the closest corresponding letters of another language. So here's what the evidence reveals what was done with the Vulgate. The G, one of the G's was dropped, replaced with an N. Then they replaced the O with a U. There's your Latin transliteration of the Greek word angelos. Then our word angel is a transliteration of the Latin, which is a transliteration of the Greek word angelos. Notice, the U-S is dropped, and you have the English word angel. This is why I say that this is the worst type of anachronism imaginable, reading a concept back into a period in which it does not belong, like the disciples rode bicycles on their missionary journeys. Well, everyone knows that the disciples, that there weren't any bicycles in the first century. And you know, this is not an isolated incident. Embarrassing translational gaps like this occur from time to time, like the creation of the word bondservant. According to McClintock and Strong's Cyclopedia of Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature, the word bondservant was invented by the authorized King James translators. Volume 9, page 793. I have enlarged the box portion on the right above it for your reading enjoyment. They state, the Hebrew and Greek terms designating servitude are for the male, ebed, doulos for the female. Ama or shifka, dule, usually rendered bondman or servant, etc., which our translators have instinctively felt were more euphonious and appropriate words. Well, what does euphonious mean? Euphonious, of sound, especially speech, pleasing to the ear. You see, this is just another reason why we as Bible students need to study to show ourselves approved by God, not merely readers. And now before I close, I want you to see that the Bible only speaks of two types of feathery winged celestial beings, and then we'll bring this video to its conclusion. We have seen that there are words in, the, in our English Bible that are used to refer to feathery winged created celestial beings, and they are cherub, seraph. Well, cherubim is the plural form of cherub, meaning many cherubs. And seraphim is the plural form of seraph, mean, meaning many seraphs. And then there is Elohim. And Elohim is not a category or type of feathery winged heavenly creatures. It simply means mighty ones. It is used to describe both cherubs and seraphs. But angel is not one of them. In fact, there are only two categories or orders of winged celestial created beings. The Bible only speaks of two types of feathery winged celestial creatures, and they are seraph, meaning burning one, and the plural form seraphim, meaning burning ones, who appear in human form but with four faces, a face of a man, a face of a lion, a face of a bull, and a face of an eagle. But I couldn't find an image for this one, which is why you only see one face on this one. Then you have the cherub, or the Cherubim, the plural form. You see that in Ezekiel 1, 5, 5 through 14. These cherubs have traits of both humans and animals. You see this in Ezekiel 1, 5 through 14, including Isaiah 6, 2, and 10, 19 through 22. So we have the singular form of seraph and the plural form of seraphim, and the singular form of cherub and its plural form of cherubim. So the so called angel that is portrayed in artwork and stained glass windows, as we have seen, is a myth created by the Roman Catholic Church. And what about the fifth word, Elohim? Elohim means mighty ones, simply means mighty ones, and is applied to both seraphs and cherubs. 
And now I want to conclude this instructional video by returning our attention to the concept that I began this video with. There is no word in the entire Bible that carries the meaning angel. The moment you read the meaning angel into Holy Scripture, you have read a foreign thought into the sacred text. Therefore, as was the case with the Corinthians who were spreading false teachings or doctrines, the moment you say angel, you corrupt yourself, hindering your sanctification. Do not be led astray Evil communication corrupts good manners, Young's literal translation. And so, I hope that this instructional video has been of assistance to you. And so this is Angel Ariano Jr. reminding you to always remember to do all things according to the scriptures.